It's great that uh, this morning's all about, well, this today is all about storytelling. Um, no, I'm, I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about the Encyclopedia of Life and how we've been trying to embed some of the storytelling tools in the work that we're doing. So the Encyclopedia of Life is a uh, project, as John mentioned, to aggregate information about all life on Earth. Um, so it's a global endeavor uh, that brings together a number of uh, institutions, uh, organizations around the world um, to standardize information about species and then put it together on a website and make it available for scientists, educators, general public, everybody under Creative Commons licenses. So it can be reused, repurposed, and so on. Uh, EOL started about uh, in 2007 or so, and since that time we've aggregated over 7 million data objects, so that includes text, images, sound, so on. Um, uh, for about 1.3 million species. Uh, there are about 1.9 million named species right now, and of course many more that are not named. Um, <clears throat> so this is an ongoing project, obviously, that uh, will hopefully keep evolving and building over time. Um, I work on the uh, education side of the project. So at Harvard, uh, uh, we're the working group for education. So our task is to take this amazing resource and make it more accessible and available for educators and students. Um, so one of the things that we try to do is build tools and applications that um, allow students to really engage with this kind of content, um, be creative with the content, um, and also uh, participate in collecting data that can be uh, contributed as well. Uh, so I just have highlighted a couple of the sort of tools we have here. This is a, a food web explorer tool where we can put together a collection of species, um, bring in trophic uh, interaction data, and let students play around and sort of see for particular areas uh, how different species interact and so on. And it uses the EOL API to pull in content about, uh, about those species. Um, and we have a tool that uh, we're working on now to build uh, species cards. So these are sort of like trait cards uh, for species and so on. Um, and, and then there are uh, things like games. So we have a, a template for building games out of collections of species uh, on EOL. So on EOL, you can make a collection of species. And I didn't start my timer. Oh, well. Um, anyway, so, uh, so there are a bunch of tools like that. Um, and we really think it's important for students to actually get out and experience uh, biodiversity in their local areas as well. So we also work with partners like iNaturalist, who we heard about uh, uh, on Monday. Um, so students can get out, use some of uh, these great tools, and actually collect data and contribute to science. Um, so that's a big piece of what we're trying to do as well. Uh, but we've also found that educators really need more context. So it's great to have the Encyclopedia of Life out there, but without more context, it's hard for teachers to talk about climate change um, and some of the other type uh, areas that they want to, you know, food webs and so on. So lately, we've been starting this project called uh, EOL Places. And the idea with Places is that we provide content uh, around particular ecosystems and habitats that are important. Um, and the idea is to partner with organizations like many of you um, who have expertise in an area maybe like the Galapagos. So John brought up that example, how they're collecting all this amazing footage, um, immersive experiences. We want to bring all that stuff together describe what this place is, why it's important, um, and so on, and then bring in all the species content along with uh, these tools as well. So within the context of these places, um, we have you know, the food web, games, um, and other experiences that, uh, that students can, um, can play around with and, and build content around and so on. Uh, this is an example of uh, a place in Okaloosa County in Florida where we have five different habitats. Um, so for each one, we have a food web, um, a deck of cards, and so on. So, and then we're also developing lesson plans as well to go along with these type of things. But the idea is that this is sort of a template system that we can then replicate across many um, important ecosystems and habitats around the world and just keep building on it. So it'll be hopefully a great resource um, once we get further along. Um, and one of the uh, ideas that I've been thinking about is, is maybe using Google Earth as, a, as actually the mechanism for exploring this type of stuff. So um, that might be a possibility as Google Earth keeps evolving as well. Um, but one of the things that we've used Google Earth for is to tell stories around some of these places and some of the species. So this, um, 
tour was put together with, in partnership with the Atlantic Public Media. It was um, really written and, and created by uh, Ed, Eduardo Garcia uh, Milagros, who um, did some amazing work for us. Um, so I wanted just to show you a couple snippets um, from this uh, so you get an, a sense of, of what it's like. Hopefully the audio will play. Arctic terns have stubby legs, so they're clumsy on land. But in the sky, that's a different story. It's a very elegant bird in the air. This is really a bird that's made for life in the sky. And says Karsten Egevang, a researcher at the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources, Arctic terns put that flying ability to good use. It so you can see this is a really nice way of starting to bring together some you know, audio, narrative, uh, bring in the voice of the scientist who's working on this. Um, but then again, within the context of you know, where these things are going on in, on, on the Earth. So I'm just going to skip along a little bit to give you a better sense of um, how uh, we use Google Earth to But after show, leaving this the case, breeding grounds, the birds spent a month hanging out in the middle of the North Atlantic. This was completely unknown that the birds would do that. Most of what's driving their migratory path is food, so they hang around spots where there are lots of small fish to eat, like this part of the Atlantic. They start flying south again in September. And then something really surprising happening around equator. There is a migratory divide, a split. About half the bird would follow the coast of Africa, whereas the other half would cross the Atlantic and then follow the coast of South America. But even though the birds would be scattered all over the Atlantic Ocean, all of them came back to spend the winter in the Weddell Sea down at Antarctica, where they will find an iceberg and rest and just fish and eat throughout the winter. From so if you want to see what happens to the Arctic terns on their, the rest of their journey, you have to go and check it out. It's on YouTube. You can just uh, Google Arctic tern, Google Earth tour, and I, I'm sure you'll find it. So, uh, so that's just a brief overview. Um, I'd love to talk with you in more depth about how we might collaborate around these kinds of things. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to speak. Any questions for Jeff? Thank you, Jeff. That was great. Yeah. Brian. A really wonderful project. I'm wondering if there's a way to add uh, indigenous language names for these species. This would be a wonderful opportunity to, to, to you know, preserve the English, uh, indigenous language words for species like these. Yeah. So um, I didn't really get into the Encyclopedia of Life's website itself very much, but um, there are actually uh, quite easy ways of adding content. Um, anyone can add content. It's a curated sort of authoritative site, but um, so how we handle that is things that uh, information that comes from scientific organizations that's already vetted comes in as trusted. Um, things that you and I might add, such as a name, uh, would come in as unreviewed. So it's still there and people can see it, but it's marked as unreviewed until the curators have had a chance to uh, to look at it. But there are um, there's a way of adding uh, common names for species in in different languages. Yeah. 